All right. A. Antonine Artaud. On December, on December 9th, 1945, Antonine Artaud wrote from Rodez to Henri Patiso. He complains of the army of spellbinders waiting to burst into him from all sides, to camp in his mind, feed on his flesh, and live off his life. He says what it is to carry such an army inside him, to be a teeming, deserted land, to have nothing inside but a hell of outsiders. He describes worse than pain that eternal hell, the exploding of his real self. In this letter of December 9, 1945, he raves. We can call it that too. That he's Jesus nailed to the cross in Golgotha, and then thrown on a dumb heap. He's the blasphemer and the bishop of Rodez, Saint Anthony, and Lucifer. And in the notebooks he fills that winner, he also proclaims himself father, mother, man, woman, frenetic substance of all beginnings, womb for countless stars. His body has taken on the dimensions of the entire universe, has become the adopted land of theogenies. His mind eludes him, but gathers into itself the whole history of humanity. He's master of reality. Possibility is what he decides. The infinite obeys him because he says, reality, don't get it. He himself is reality, sonorous, overflowing, throbbing, that he is also Antonin Artaud. Monsieur Antonin Artaud, born September 4, 1896, in Marseille, precise, he still knows, but it's a little interest, an idea at the back of his mind, an outdated thesis. On the other hand, one thing he does know, floating in all this wreckage, one calm, clear truth, to which you feel when he utters it, that he could, for a moment, cling. I'm a great poet, that's all. In the winter of 45, Artaud has already been locked up for eight years. He had been in the asylum at the sotteville Saut rouen in St. Anne, where Lacan judged him set in his madness, forever incapable of writing. The Edva, where he was transferred from the ward for agitated inmates to that of the epileptics, then the senile, and then from the ward of the senile to that of the undesirable. In Rodez, where he arrived in February 43, half starved and dressed like a tramp, he spoke of God with Dr. Latre Molière and poetry with Dr. Ferrier. And he translated Lewis Carroll, genuflected in the cathedral, and spat and crossed himself on passing pregnant women. He was also subjected to 1,200 electric shocks in three years. He would emerge from these sessions broken, boneless, and formless, no nerves in his body, no blood in his head, in a huddled state. For weeks he would be in pursuit of his being, like a dead man alongside a living man who is no longer him. But he started writing again, drawing, filling the new books. On December 10th, 1945, the day after Artaud's letter to Henri Parisot, my father was born. I don't know when he was first hospitalized. I might have been able to find some record, perhaps, in one of his notebooks, black leather diaries, school exercise books, rough books, blocks of headed note paper from hotels, loose sheets, jottings on the back of lecture notes, enough to fill several cardboard boxes. 
Some could be ascribed the names of hospitals and nursing homes he'd spent time in, the La Roseray notebooks, La Verrière notebooks, Epine notebooks, and so on. My father was not a great poet, that's all. He didn't enshrine his suffering in beauty and power, his madness in genius, didn't invent a language of consecration and conflagration. I've read some of his notebooks and forgotten them. All I know is that every day of his life, or almost, he lived. Every morning, every evening, he'd sit down at his desk, like Paul Mall or a Craven A their ash burned holes in the pages and try to reconstitute his life. No stories apart from dreams, but accounts, interviews, accounts overviews, to-do lists, join the girls, pay the rent, hold on until tomorrow, and the next day we cross them out and write dumb in the margin. And most of all, diagrams drawn drawn again, straight lines split into segments of happiness, sadness, times with or without alcohol, with or without hospitalization, bristling with dates and names, then gradually the straight lines became fewer and fewer, and there are a series of upturned triangles peaks, troughs, crests, and rifts, tracing the map of his melancholia on the square paper. All I retain of my father's life is its inner relief, its seismographic translation. I would be no more able or willing than he to recount it to go through the means and dates that make up the story in whose shadow I grew up. I can follow its rugged geography, its imprecise geometry with my finger. I know these are the contours of the dark side, the negative of my life, that its rifts correspond to its absences and that, even at a distance, I fell into them with him. I don't know who he was any more than he did. All I know is that every morning, every evening, when he opened his notebooks, it was this he was looking for, these countless lines, and even in his worst moments, elegant, regular characters weave the net in which he tried to catch himself or stretch the canvas on which he was the empty center. That's what he wanted, to grasp, catch, collar, so. All right, um, are you ready to answer a few questions? All right, so um, I suppose that I arrived at this book partly because I love our toes. So I'm opening it and account encountering this first section absidary in the sense that it begins with an A section and proceeds through the alphabet. It was incredibly exciting and delicious to open and encounter Arto at the outset. But what gave you the idea for the absidary structure in the first place? It really came as a sort of solution. Um, I mean, the story of this book is, is quite, uh, well, there is a story in it, but I, I actually, uh, inherited the manuscript from my father with this injunction after his death. This injunction written on it, which was um, to novelize, to be to put into, to novelize, does this make sense in yes, English? Yes, yes. Uh, so I have this kind of, uh, you know, phantomatic um, order. Um, I knew this manuscript wasn't, you know, an intimate diary that you know, people usually say in France. It was actually really, a sort of estimate diary. It was really such a, it was already a kind of, a, I think it was already novelized. Uh, it was already a kind of impossible uh, self-portrait. Self uh, but still, I really didn't know what to do with it. So I really spent uh, ages just 
her reading it, uh, trying to hear it, um, trying to recognize, uh, you know, really sort of a musical um, hearing uh, references and so on. Um, and I really didn't want to, uh, to write uh, what we would call in France a uh, roman de deuil, you know, brief novel or a familial novel. Um, I also didn't want to say anything about myself. I remember that I started by uh, forbidding me the use of the first person. <laughs> and uh, I have some, you know, some preparatory notes and I wrote that the, almost immediately I wrote there won't be any place in this book for, for childhood memories. Um, so, you know, I just don't know what to do with this manuscript and with this kind of uh, sepulchral uh, order comment. Um, and so the adversary really came as a solution uh, for many reasons, I think. First of all, because it really sort of, you know, put a distance uh, with the the intimate with the eye and so on. Uh, also, it was the most faithful form to kind of my subject, or this subject, but to say sort of multiple subjects. Um, and also there was a kind of, there was something sort of, a, you know, childish, childish and quite um, playful uh, in, you know, the very fact of, you know, going from uh, A, like Anton Arto, to B, like James Bond, um, a sort of, um, well, you know, as Perec, as Georges Perec would say, obviously, uh, sort of, of great liberty uh, generated by, by, by constraint. Yeah. Oui, voilà. right. Right. Um, and we should note that the Z is zealic in this book. Right. Yeah. <laughs> But Z like Delhi, I mean, you know, it seems to be obvious, and finally, that was really at the very, very last moment. I, I can't remember what Z was, because it's, a, it's an exhaustive adversary that was, you know, the other constraint. I could have had the sort of lacunary adversary, but it was, it's exhaustive. And, uh, and Z was something else, but, you know, say Z is just so obvious, but it, it really came at the very, at the very end. So you mentioned Perec. Are there other um, are there other novels structurally that you used as a touchstone for making that decision about how to order the fragments? No, not novels. I don't think so. Well, you mentioned in the beautiful preface, you mentioned Bart, you yes. mentioned the fragments for yeah. the and I, I love his discourse. Right. Yeah. Um, uh, which obviously was very important for me, but I, you know, that wasn't conscious. I mean, once the text was finished, maybe somebody else in France told me. That. And, uh, so, and there was something that I was also, you know, um, well, this is a film actually, a film about Jean Deleuze, which is an abecedary, mm -hmm. which was actually made by my um, stepfather, when my mother's second husband. But so I only realized when the book was finished, then the, actually I had adopted to speak of my father before my stepfather had adopted. Wow. So, well, this is exciting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. right. huh. And that wasn't an exhaustive adversary. Jim Deleuze's adversary is not exhaustive. Huh. And you sometimes have, you know, uh, three words for one letter, and uh, sometimes just two. Yeah. 